Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about some work that we did over uh, the summer um, with uh, Joe Fischer and Miriam Luke Avery at uh, Mozilla and uh, co authors uh, from Birmingham City Council and TU Delft. And um, I'm going to start off by talking about design and the different things that can mean. Sometimes it's this very precise activity where you're responding to a particular brief and a given set of constraints, and um, it's very precise and it looks like that. And then other, other times you get weird stuff like this. This is a piece of critical design which is called, I want to give birth to a shark, um, for reasons I haven't got time to explain right now. And you also get design fiction, which is all kinds of crazy stuff. And in a recent paper, uh, Felizzi and colleagues kind of said, ah, enough is enough with this, let's get divorced and proposed that constructive design, research through design, should be considered quite separately from um, critical work or this kind of more speculative stuff. And there's this moment where, uh, in the abstract, they say, we've observed a growing conflict within the design research community between uh, pragmatical and critical researchers. To help reduce this conflict, we call for a divorce. But I think sometimes divorce doesn't always result in a reduction of conflict, and maybe that's not the way forward. Um, in STS, in socio-technical studies, it's been kind of long established, this idea that criticism isn't just about debunking, okay? And Bruno Latour here says, the critic is not the one who lifts the rugs from under the feet of the naive believers, but the one who offers the participants arenas in which to gather. And that was the kind of uh, approach um, that we took for a workshop uh, at Mozilla's All Hands meeting, which was exploring this space of uh, the web of things, uh, voice activation, and uh, the home hub. You know, home hub space now is very crowded in the marketplace. We've got Alexa, we've got Siri, we've got Google Home and things like that. These uh, devices which we can use voice commands to order our shopping and whatnot. And these things also kind of cause a lot of concern about privacy, right, because they're listening all the time. And, you know, the logs have been uh, requested in, uh, you know, murder cases and so on. And the companies insist, no, we're only listening for the wake word and we don't record anything else. But people are concerned, right? And Zuckerberg said in 2010, well, you know, things are just changing. Our ideas of privacy are radically different now. Um, so this is a kind of inherently uh, interesting space in terms of um, social criticism, I think. And um, Joe Fish K uh, asked me at the, uh, the last guy if I would um, run a design fiction workshop. Um, and he wanted something that would be as kind of exploratory and imaginative as uh, possible. And at the time, Enrique and I were working on the idea of a, a fictional author. And we imagined uh, a writer in the 1940s um, who was very prescient about today's technology, imagined versions of Twitter back then, imagined Facebook back then. And it's kind of interesting to think, well, what would Facebook have looked like under Stalin? And, you know, you can kind of uh, defamiliarize the technology in that way. So we thought we might do that kind of thing with design workbooks. So design workbooks um, are things that people use to assemble their initial ideas and their um, inspirations, their first thoughts. This is an example from one, um, one of uh, Bill Gaver's uh, projects. And we thought it might be fun to, uh, to create an imaginary designer, some designer from some other country somewhere, and a found notebook, something that we just sort of come across. Um, so I did these kind of uh, very brief sketches, and then Enrique, who is back there, just um, uh, ran with this idea and became very inspired by this book, uh, Codex Serafinianus, which I don't know if you know it, but I, I didn't know it until Enrico pointed it out, but it's just extraordinary. It's written in this invented language. I think it was published in the 80s. And it's full of these odd taxonomies and strange diagrams and uh, this totally invented language there of text and it kind of the author said that what he wanted to do is give the impression that children have when they read a book for adults before they can read they know there's some sense there but they don't know what that sense is right so um 
Enrique uh, used that as a kind of jumping off point to create these imaginary workbooks for, for the workshop and just did this beautiful job, I thought. You know, came up with these crazy uh, diagrams and uh, hybrid creatures and um, odd notations, which kind of hinted at a design space without specifying any particular idea. So we thought that these might be ambiguous enough to kind of create a space where people could talk about possibilities and potentials in quite a wild way and in quite an unpredictable way as well. We didn't particularly know how people would respond to these or indeed even if they would uh, respond to these. Um, but we gave out the workbooks uh, at the workshop and um, we asked people to pick one that they liked and then to kind of play the game, you know, to imagine that they'd found this workbook in some sort of non-place like an airport. Um, can we make any sense of it? Can we, you know, decipher what's going on? And there were quite a lot of engineers there, so they immediately started looking for patterns in the to see if it was a language kind of thing, but then kind of got more into the kind of spirit of it and just became um, creative and started to annotate it and think, well, this could be some kind of alternative network or this might be some sort of mobile router or whatever. Um, and then we asked them to take these kinds of imaginings of what the system might be or do and put them into a story framework. And we used um, Kurt Vonnegut's story shapes to do this. So um, on these diagrams, uh, you've got ill fortune and good fortune running top to bottom and then beginning to end there. And you see um, a Kafka story starts off pretty low and, for, and then dips. Things, things go from bad to worse in Kafka. Um, and then the one next to Kafka on the left there is a man in a hole, right? And this is the kind of uh, story that we typically get in HCI, where you find, you find somebody starts kind of, uh, you know, pretty, in pretty good shape and then has some problem, gets into a hole and then gets out of it again, right? And usually if we're telling a story in HCI, the problem is solved by whatever technology we're, we're currently interested in, okay? So we asked them to tell some kind of story uh, like that. And um, although, you know, they, a lot of the people in the room were kind of engineers and things like that, and some more used to it, to, less used to it, rather, this kind of ideation than, than others. Um, they really surprised us, and one of the guys kind of did this beautiful, spontaneous uh, story about um, uh, a guy in an automated vehicle feeling very oppressed uh, as they were going along the freeway and then hacking into it and driving off into freedom. And, um, but but, but again, other of the stories were much more dystopian. We got some very dark stuff. You know, we got kind of like, well, probably people want to go off grid. Uh, they don't want to be, uh, you know, subject to any kind of surveillance. They want to go off grid in some way and form some resistance. Um, you know, Trump had just been elected, and I think that was kind of shaping uh, a lot of the, the the kind of fears and concerns in the room at that moment. Um, and when we ran this similar sort of workshop in Sweden, we got a totally different result. It was all kind of quite jolly and well. This could be a somesthetic experience and stuff. So I think it kind of functioned as a kind of reflection of the participants as well. You know, as an interesting kind of uh, loop between you know, the stimuli and the response in that sense. And then we asked them to imagine different settings. So, you know, picture this kind of technology in North Korea. What would this look like in the Congo? That kind of thing. And we got a bunch of interesting ideas, um, as you often do in these workshops. And one criticism of this kind of approach is, well, you have your interest in discussions and then it ends and so what. Um, but we both kind of went in different directions with it. So Joe Fish and his team uh, realized that there was a lot of fear around this technology. And so like Joe Fish's next move after this was to commission this cartoon to make it look friendly and less scary, less, less of a kind of surveillance kind of uh, moment. And I started talking about it with a social worker friend of mine uh, called Rob McCabe, who's working in uh, Birmingham. And um, he had done some research on uh, a cohort of particularly challenging kids in uh, a school. And he'd worked out that some 75 kids had cost the city about 75 million pounds in fees to young offenders uh, institutions like this. And it's well known um, uh, that 
these kinds of facilities are very, very broken. They cost a huge amount of money. It's much more expensive to send a young offender to this kind of place than it is to send them to Eton. And when I spoke to, to Rob about the, the workshop and the kinds of ideas that we were having um, about voice activation, about different kinds of sensors, about you know uh, uh, this kind of smart environment, he got quite interested in uh, the possibilities for that, for working with families with complex multiple uh, needs. And we were thinking, well, maybe there would be some potential in this space for uh, uh, providing someone with support. And imagine um, uh, a young mother, say, with a 15-year-old who's bigger than her, maybe a history of violence, maybe they're frightened of them. Are there any kinds of senses that could be implemented to kind of support that family? And the approach that Rob has is very much not what's wrong with this kid, but what's going on in this family. It's a kind of holistic uh, approach with wraparound services from multiple agencies so that the um, the idea is that you make your intervention long before um, the, 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 the the person is facing any kind of uh, spell in a in, in, in a young offenders facility say so you modified Joe Fish's cartoon to look like this and then also went back to the um, workbooks and started to play around uh, in that space. And imagine this hub called Winnie, and maybe there are sensors around, um, you know, maybe we're tracking what's going on in terms of monitoring uh, different areas of the home. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, sensors are indicating that people are stressed in various ways and suggesting anger management programs, meditation programs, and so on. And so we uh, had these workbook pages that were uh, written in English. Now, obviously, this stuff is really kind of scary, right? This is all very kind of um, surveillance-heavy stuff. And um, there's a kind of reluctance maybe to even go into this direction. But the fact of the matter is this kind of technology is with us. It's happening. These kinds of bracelets and so on are often used as alternatives to incarceration. And how we're treating young offenders is almost certain to change. So if you look at a history of discipline and punishment like uh, the one by Foucault, you're really struck by uh, Foucault's um, juxtaposition of two design artifacts. He puts together this execution, the execution of a regicide by um, being hung, drawn, quartered, tortured to death. Next to that, he puts a prison timetable specifying for, by, by in five to 10 minute intervals exactly what somebody's going to be doing all day long. And he points out that these two mechanisms are separated by only a few decades. And they express the same abstract idea of justice, right? And lots of weird alternatives were considered before just incarceration became you know, the blanket policy for any uh, offense. And um, what we do now with young people would look very odd to our uh, 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 ancestors, and will no doubt look very odd to our descendants as well. So things will change, and we felt it was worth exploring that space, but in a in a kind of careful and um, critical way. So we went back to the idea of the imaginary author uh, in the 1940s, and what would this kind of technology have looked like back then? And we looked at um, you know people like uh, Timothy Garton Ash, who had gone back and seen his his own KGB files after they'd been made. Uh, public and had a very odd experience of having his own life represented to him uh, by the state official accounts of it and so on. And hundreds and hundreds of pages were produced, and that was a small file for Timothy Gott and Ash. You know, they ran to thousands of pages. So imagine what that would be like with a monitoring system uh, like the ones uh, we've been thinking of. And you know, we put together a, a kind of story that was a bit like the lives of others and that kind of thing and reflected on some of the kind of darker possibilities of this. We talked about it in terms of it being a Stasi godmother, and maybe it gives you, in some instances, helpful advice. Maybe you know it does, in fact, help a few children, but maybe it's also open to abuses, to corruption. And the kind of thing that is actually happening now and documented in this book, which is called Automating Inequality, and I really heartily recommend this book to you if you, if you haven't already uh, read it. And um, it's a very interesting account of uh, the way that algorithms are reproducing social inequality. And one of the most disturbing examples is uh, about this uh, tool, the Algamy Family Screening Tool. And this is like the official website uh, for it. 
um, which is sort of mainly happy, smiling white people. But um, according to automating inequality, this system disproportionately targets minorities and the poor. And it uses predictive variables which are not st statistically significant, maps them to outcome variables um, in a way which is really statistical fishing. And um, this has this huge disproportionate effect on the poor who are the most likely to be in the system because if they come into contact with any welfare, they have to kind of volunteer their information uh, in order to get it. Um, and there's a moment where she, um, uh, she says, feuding neighbors, estranged spouses, seeking custody, landlords and family members with interpersonal access to grind routinely call uh, as punishment or retribution. And these calls are logged and then they increase your score. And uh, there's a call center and you, know, you get a, a, a number through for how at risk your child is. And this increases with these, with these variables. So it's a really dangerous space. It's a really difficult space, but it's a space nevertheless that I think that we uh, are gonna see more of and have to think about and think about critically if we're gonna do anything constructive uh, at all. Um, so with this work, you know, um, and like with any kind of uh, paper, I guess, you can present it in, in a number of ways. So it would have been possible to kind of just present this kind of thing as an ironic provocation, right? To kind of say, well, let's abolish prison for young people by turning their homes into prisons. You know, a kind of Swiftian kind of modest proposal. Um, or you could just do it as a critique of things like Alexa and Siri and say, well, the technology that you're willing to adopt and that you're living with now can be framed as a punishment for a crime. Um, or um, you could present it in a constructive way and say, well, this technology offers alternatives to an existing system which is completely and utterly broken. Um, but what I would like to argue is that uh, there are not strict divisions between these things and the uh, dichotomy um, between constructive and critical design is false because design is never neutral. Uh, and I'll leave it there and take questions. Thanks very much. Okay, great, we have time for a few questions. Thank you, Mark, for your presentation. Um, one of the things I really liked about it is how you kind of treat the critical and how this is actually something that can, it's, it's not about kind of shutting down, but opening up and kind of um, breaking down boundaries. And so I was hoping maybe you could um, maybe like reflect a little bit more on like the last point that you left off on. So in the, in the sense that maybe kind of uh, critical design works and constructive design, maybe these boundaries aren't so, need to be so rigid, but how um, might we move towards uh, to use the metaphor of marriage, uh, reconciliation, or like, what, so is it, is it about maybe using these kinds of works as like boundary objects for bringing kind of designers with different perspectives together, or like where, where would you see this kind of going out next if you had to kind of forecast further? Um, I, I, I think that, um, you know, I mean, in fairness to Felizzi and colleagues, they talk about it as a continuum, and I don't want to make a straw man argument. And, you know, you can understand the way that, you know, people might kind of want to, differentiate between different kinds of activity in design, and that's okay. Um, but I think especially in a space like this, it's quite dangerous to kind of uh, take a position that you're just responding to a brief, that you're just engaging in a piece of uh, research that's tackling a design question rather than a social question or a political question, because I think in this space, you're inherently dealing with social and political uh, issues, and your design is going to either uh, you know challenge uh, a status quo or intensify uh, and, and and exacerbate a, a status quo. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this. And um, you know, uh, there was a kind of bulletin from the ACM talking about um, uh, how important it is to recognise that the technologies that we're talking about might not be the things that are making the world a better place, might be actually making things much, much worse. And I think as a community, we're very optimistic and we're inclined to kind of think that, well, we're you know, all working for the good, but that's not guaranteed. And I think we have to start to be very careful, which means being very critical. Uh, Vicky Mulder, University of Tokyo. Hi. Uh, I have a quick question first. I just want to say thank you for your presentation. Very interesting work. Um, you end on design isn't neutral, and then you just discussed a little bit about how design perhaps may have relationships to political structures, 
And I'm wondering if you have visions of the future of how these frameworks could overlap. So, uh, of how the frameworks could what, sorry? Well, I, I'm assuming that if design isn't neutral, yeah. then design is political, all yeah. design is political. So how would you incorporate that knowledge into more future work? Um, well, I, I think that work which uh, surfaces um, assumptions and um, helps us to think uh, in, in self-reflexive ways is very useful. And so I think there's a lot of potential in design fiction. I think we've only just begun to explore that kind of uh, uh, territory, really. And yesterday I was talking about design fiction as a kind of uh, thought experiment to help us to do that. And I think too often we, 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 I mean, we construct fictions all the time in design. Um, it's part of the process. But um, I think too often we're kind of telling happy stories, man gets out of whole stories. And I think it's sometimes very helpful to think of 